Coming up on today's Locked On Dodgers, we're talking Clayton Kershaw's best starts as a Dodger. So make sure to tap in and keep it Locked On Dodgers. You are Locked On Dodgers, your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yo, 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 Dodger fans, welcome to Locked On Dodgers. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, the number one local sports daily podcast network. Locked On, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. I'm Vince Samperio, Chavez Ravine Fiends, here with Jeff Snyder of Baseball Essential. And Jeff, we're together, but MLB and the Players Union haven't got together and made a deal yet, so we are still officially in lockout. Yeah, that's super fun. It's a uh, it's a lot of fun as a baseball fan to uh, instead of I always look forward to Super Bowl Sunday because it always means hey, we're only like a week away from pitchers and catchers reporting the spring training, and this year with them pushing the Super Bowl back by a week, uh, it could have been even even closer. We would have been only a day or two away, but instead. Who knows how far away we are from pitchers and catchers reporting to spring training, and it is stupid. Yeah, but we are here to bring you not stupid things. We're going to talk a little bit about just some small tidbits of news and then talk about we some of Clayton Kershaw's best games. We did uh, our favorite home runs last week, and then we thought about favorite pitching performances. Uh, but Kershaw is his own category because once we started thinking about it, uh, we were already about six, seven deep of just Kershaw before we got to anybody else. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Just want to, before doing that, remind you and thank you for making Lockdown Dodgers your first listen of the day every day. We are free and available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube every Monday through Friday. Uh, but before we get to Kershaw stuff, just uh, one thing that a news popped up today. Everyone's kind of running with it because any drop of MLB news uh, everyone's gonna kind of run with it. The CBA expired, but I guess also the drug agreement between the two sides also expired. So players aren't currently getting tested for steroids. Um, the news being that theoretically some players could get some cycles in right now or get some kind of illegal things or illegal, I guess technically not illegal right now, but uh, illegal things in and out of their system before baseball is back i'm not sure if this is a big deal or not i don't think we're going to see a bunch of roided out guys this season hitting 50 home runs but uh like i said a bit of news that we can touch on yeah and i doubt there's anybody who's going to say oh i've never used any of these things before but now that it's not currently for the next uh few days or weeks uh against the rules technically i'm going to go ahead and give it a shot and so I don't think there's going to be a huge impact uh, from this, but it is kind of a, for, for me, it's kind of an example of one of the, one of the bits of messaging we've seen from a, a few people on social media is that uh, the lack of a CBA isn't why spring training isn't going to start on time. Um, it's the fact that the owners locked the players out and that they could have, continued to move forward without a CBA in place and continue to negotiate, but not let it affect the, the season. Uh, and that the reason, you know, that spring training is not going to start is because of the lockout. And while that's all technically true, this is a good example of why there are practical issues with that idea and why uh, in the absence of an agreement, probably a lockout made the most sense because it wouldn't make sense to be getting ready to start the season without a drug drug testing uh, program in place. It wouldn't make sense to get ready to start a season not knowing what uh, the luxury tax is going to be, for example, uh, trying to go through free agency without knowing that. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why it wouldn't make sense. Now, it doesn't make sense that it took them seven weeks to start negotiating after the lockout started. It doesn't make sense that uh, a lot of things that are going on don't make sense, but it definitely makes sense to not try to play a season without these agreements in place because uh, rules are good and, and structure is good. 
Yeah, and that's just how it is. The owners are supposed to meet today through Thursday. You would hope that uh, a counter proposal with some some concessions on their side will be coming out of that, and then some actual negotiations can happen. Uh, we know that the players declined the federal mediator, basically citing that the owners haven't tried to negotiate yet, so there's no reason for mediation since the one side hasn't started negotiating. So we'll see there. Um, I did see Marcus Stroman called Rob Manfred man clown and on social media, and he's one of the, the guys that's – been the most vocal for sure in terms of not just right now but in general but uh he's definitely not holding back anything right now so uh you know props to him yeah man clown isn't an extremely clever nickname uh i think i prefer it over the overused man fraud uh that, that a lot of people use uh, clown is probably a better description of rob manfred than than fraud uh i don't think he's a fraud any more than uh, you know, I won't finish that sentence. Um, you know, but but yeah, he's definitely a clown, and uh, so yeah, not, not many points for for creativity for Stroman, but uh, it, it is fun, if nothing else, to see uh, an active player get get after it like that and be willing to call it out. Uh, I I should mention probably the last active player to be that vocal about uh, Manfred being a clown was Trevor Bauer and that in some ways may not have worked out as well as people might've liked. Uh, so uh, probably Stroman may not enjoy being mentioned in the same se sentence as Trevor Bauer, uh, but you know, it is what it is. Both Mets pitchers, right? Didn't the Mets sign Bauer last off season? Yeah. For uh, about five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then last bit, we're not going to get too deep into it, but Keith Law released his prospect or farm system rankings, prospect rankings last week, farm system rankings this week. He has the Dodgers as the number one overall farm system, uh, higher than anyone else has had them. They're in the top 10 range for most places that have released, uh, maybe a little bit out of the top 10 in a couple, if I'm not mistaken. But we will have him on at some point, hopefully this week, to talk about all that and see why he loves the Dodgers system so much. Yeah, we had Keith on the show last year when he released his his – uh, ranking system and had a really a good time talking Dodger prospects with, with him last year. And I've reached out to him and he has, uh, he's on board with coming on again to talk with us. So hopefully that'll happen this week. We're just working out scheduling right now. So I uh, don't know exactly what day that will be, but we will dig in a lot uh, uh, into why he loves the Dodgers and hates every other team. And that's, uh, that's important information. Yeah. That's stuff we want to know about. All right, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about Clayton Kershaw's, our favorite performances, best performances, however you want to word it. Basically, just pouring love on Kershaw like he deserves. Before, let's talk about Built Bar. Built Bar, it's the time of year. You know, New Year's resolutions, February has started. You know, maybe, you're, maybe you've been pushing it back. You'll start in February. You'll start out for the Super Bowl, whatever the case is. Built Bar is going to be here for you no matter what time you start. And it doesn't matter. You start on your own time. Or maybe you just want a good tasting protein bar that tastes great. You know, maybe you just want something that's a little bit healthier than a candy bar, but tastes just as good and has benefits for you. That's what Built Bar's got. All their bars are covered in chocolate. They're always around 130 calories, around 4 grams sugar, 4 grams net carbs, a bunch of protein, a bunch of fiber. Better than better in every aspect than a candy bar and similar in taste. So we can't ask for much more than that. And right now, if you go to built.com and use the promo code LOCK15, you'll get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. After you go to built.com, head over to Rock Auto because this episode is also brought to you by Rock Auto. They're a family business that's been serving do it yourselfers online for over 20 years. There's a bunch of cars out there nowadays and, you know, just those local chain stores just can't have everything you need and can't help you out with pricing the way you need. Rock Auto can. Rock Auto has a nice website where every, you can find everything based on your car, based on whatever you're looking for, and you can have it shipped directly to you for the best price out there. You don't need to be a mechanic. You don't need to work at a dealership. You can just go to rockauto.com and get treated like you're a mechanic or work at a car dealership. So head over to rockauto.com, check out their website, check out all the parts available for your car or truck, and write Locked On in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, 
rockauto.com. All right. It is time to talk about Super Week real quick. It's Super Week and it's brought to you by Get Upside. And there's no better place to get coverage of the big game than the Locked On NFL podcast. Locked On Bengals and Locked On Rams are in L.A. all week covering the big game on Radio Row. Go check them out. I'm sure there's a lot of Rams fans that listen to us that, uh, you know, you know my feelings about the Rams. But if you have stronger feelings about the Rams in positive ways, then go check out Locked On Rams. Uh, they're going to be there all week, and they're going to have stuff straight from SoFi Stadium. Okay, now let's talk about Clayton Kershaw and some of his best slash favorite performances of ours. Um, I believe the first one, I'll bring it up right now because we're both going to have it. We both have different experience with it, uh, and we've talked about it before in different times, different podcasts probably, but it's his no-hitter against the Rockies. That's you know probably the number one performance. Just no-hitters are rare. It was uh, Henley Ramirez play away from being a perfect game. And I remember being there, Jeff, you were not there, but I will let you talk about it first. Yeah, I wasn't there. I had been at the, I think the opener of that series, I think Ryu pitched against the Rockies uh, a couple days earlier. I was down there with the, a group of uh, teenagers from church and I took them down. We went to a Dodger game, went to Disneyland, went to an angel game, and then we drove home and uh, that we drove home on June 18th, the day of the no hitter. So I got home about an hour before the game started, uh, sat down to watch the game like always and got my kids out of bed in about the sixth inning, maybe seventh inning. Once we realized that it was going to be a special night, got them out of bed and watched the whole game. My mom was here in town with us. So it was me and my wife and all three of my kids and uh, my mom sitting on our couch watching the game and uh, enjoying that together and it would have been awesome to be there in person but it was really really cool to be with my family you know my my son logan was ooh seven seven years old at the time and uh that's crazy uh and, and he was already a huge kershaw fan kershaw was his favorite player already uh he remains his favorite player and so it was a really really cool thing and, and it's it was kind of the first example of a lot that I've had in my time as a Dodger fan slash dad where I've realized, wow, sometimes watching it on TV is just as good as being there because you can be there with your family. You know, part of the reason I didn't fly back to Texas uh, for the world series in 2020 after you and I were both at game one. And then I flew home and I thought about going back for games five and six when the Dodgers had a chance, you know, to, when I realized they were probably going to win the world series uh, but I wanted to be at home with my family watching it uh, because that's uh, family time is my, my Dodger fandom is very tied to to my family. And uh, so, yeah, that that Kershaw game was kind of the first example of that. Of, wow, this is a lot of fun watching on TV with my family. So it's a special game for me. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I was at the game. Uh, I think it was a what, Tuesday night, maybe, or Wednesday. I don't know. What, Thursday night, whatever it was. I think it was we a Thursday. Bought, yeah, we had bought tickets the night before. Just at that time, you know, Kershaw was – it's one of those things where now nowadays I do a Bueller where I try to go to every start of his if I can just because you know something could happen. And, you know, Bueller, Bueller's probably going to get – hopefully have one at one point. Um, you know, Kershaw ended up having the one that night and, and we just happened to buy random tickets and I forced in the right field in the all you can eat section. And, you know, just, I know I had my laptop with me cause I was working Dodgers nation at the time. So I'm live tweeting the game as I'm at the game, you know, kind of a, a, a jolted experience, but experience nonetheless. And yeah, that, that's one of those where that was my first no hitter in person that I had seen. So I knocked that off the list. Unfortunately, since then I've seen the Dodgers get no hit twice. Uh, one of a uh, one pitcher variety and one of a uh, multi pitcher variety, and I've also seen the Dodgers throw multi pitcher uh, no hitter. So I've seen a bunch of no hitters. Uh, so I'm gonna you know rue the day Henley Ramirez uh, didn't make that play until until I see a perfect game in person. But uh, can't complain too much about seeing Kershaw do it and just all the reactions we saw throughout the night. You know at that time AJ Ellis was the, the catcher, so those reactions they kept having the camera on Ellen. You know, going back and looking at the at the replays and stuff, the kid having shown Ellen on it, then Scully's announcing it. Um, you know, even like I said, if you weren't there, it's still a special night just having all that. And and for you, you know, talking about being with your family, same thing. So 
Yeah, and the uh, just before I think it was so it was uh, Corey Dickerson made the last out, struck out to end the game, and I think it was Dickerson earlier in that at bat hit a little foul pop up. And Ellis tried so hard to make the play. It ended up being just out of his reach. But A.J. Ellis was re- willing to die to get Kershaw's no-hitter. He he went so hard after that. And uh, the, the one other funny thing to watch on TV is how carefully Ellis makes sure to throw his mask as far away from possible after the game because it was just a month or so earlier that Josh Beckett had thrown a no-hitter and Ellis stepped on – Ellis wasn't even catching that game. It was whoever – who was the other catcher back then? Uh Anyway, whoever caught Josh Beckett, the end of Josh Beckett's game, his mask ended up there on the field, and A.J. Ellis sprained his ankle on the other catcher's mask and, and missed some time because of it. And so watching Ellis toss his mask away at the end of the game to make sure nobody got injured that time. And uh, Kershaw's – obviously Kershaw's raised hand thing with, they made a bobblehead out of that's probably behind me somewhere. My wife made a cross stitch out of that pose. And, uh, yeah, that, that, that was a great game. Yeah. All right, Jeff, uh, I'll let you pick the next game. The the next one, actually, uh, you know, we we won't talk too much about because I already talked about it when we were talking about our favorite home runs. Uh, But it was that same game, my first game as a season ticket holder, when Kershaw hit his only career home run. Uh, He also, by the way, oh, yeah, side note, pitched a complete game shutout on opening day. Uh, Complete games are rare enough on opening day because pitchers are usually still getting built up. Uh, but when you can do it in 96 pitches or whatever he did that game uh, and, and just dominated, it was Kershaw against Matt Cain and Cain was kind of at his peak. And so there was so much, uh, so much drama in that game. The Giants had just won the World Series for the second time in three years the previous year. Uh, Pablo Sandoval, I remember, came into the season uh, mighty big and I had been losing some weight. And so it was actually the the first time in my life that I, uh, in my adult life, I was able to say that uh, I was smaller than a major league baseball player because I was down to about 270 and Sandoval was probably up to, you know, Sandoval's only three foot four, but he was probably 390 pounds. Uh, but, but Kershaw just, just dominated. And the reason that he got to bat in the bottom of the eighth inning to hit that home run is because he was so dominant on the mound. So even in a nothing, nothing game, Don Mattingly knew our best chance to win this game is to let Kershaw keep dealing. So, uh, so they sacrificed willing to take the out and then, Oh yeah, by the way, Kershaw just hit a home run and the Dodgers Dodgers tacked on three more runs in that inning to go up four to nothing. And Kershaw finished off the complete game shutout and just a dominant performance. And, you know, I'm sure some of my affection for that game is because it was my first game as a season ticket holder, but also because it was my favorite player just dominating in a way that, you know, a couple of ways you wouldn't expect between hitting the home run and throwing a complete game on opening day, two things you don't necessarily expect. And so it was very fun, unexpected and exciting. Yeah. It's hard to argue with that one. And, you know, sticking on like the giants topic, we, we, there's a bunch of his performances that are against the giants. And it's just interesting how long his peak had been because you talked about Matt Cain being at his peak at that time. He had a lot of, you know, toe-to-toe matchups with Matt Cain, but he also had a bunch with Tim Linscomb. He also had a bunch with Madison Bumgarner, and you know they were all great for three, four year stretches. You know, I don't know if Bumgarner was ever as good as Linscomb and Cain were at their peaks, but maybe he was a little bit better longer. But Kershaw outdueled them all and continued to to still pitch better than a lot of guys on the Giants even to this day. So it's just you know a, a salute to him and and how he's extended it. So. We'll stay on that Giants one real quick and just talk about one that he had in 2015 uh, toward the end of the season. And he was – the Dodgers were looking to clinch. Uh, they could win the division. I think there was a handful of games left. And he went toe-to-toe with Madison Bumgarner. And Clint Kershaw, all he did was throw a complete game shutout with one hit allowed, one walk allowed, and 13 strikeouts. Outdueled Bumgarner. And it ended up being not a close game. The Dodgers, I think, ended up winning 8 0. Uh, but it was one of those games where Dodgers took the lead early on. Kershaw stopped the rally early on and then just dominated the rest of the way. Yeah. And that, another thing notable about that game was uh, in the fifth inning, it was uh, 2 0. Dodgers were up 2 0. But Bumgarner was pitching really well. And it kind of looked like it was going to be one of these pitchers' duels. And then uh, Scott Van Slyke 
worked a seven pitch at bat, he ended up striking out, but uh, seven pitches. And then Kershaw came up and worked a 13 pitch at bat and eventually grounded out to second base. But, you know, Bumgarner comes into that fifth inning looking really good on pitch count, looking like he's going to be able to go eight innings at least. And, uh, and then to get two outs, it took him 20 pitches. And, you know, and then uh, Kike got on an error, uh, Kendrick singled, and then eventually uh, Adrian Gonzalez popped out. But uh, it, it kind of changed the complexion of that game because instead of Bumgarner going eight or nine innings, instead he ended up going six innings. And in the sixth, maybe because of a little bit of fatigue, he gave up back-to-back homers to Justin Ruggiano and A.J. Ellis with two outs. Uh, that that kind of started to put the game away a little bit more, made it four to nothing, and uh, that that bat from Kershaw uh, again, like it, it's as much as I'm in favor of the DH, a couple of my favorite Kershaw moments are him at the plate, the home run in 2013, and then that 13 at pitch pitch at bat against Bumgarner, where he just just refused Kershaw refused to swing and miss and uh, drove up that pitch count. It was awesome. Yeah, there's a common theme among some of these also, the Giants and also Kershaw uh, performing on the offensive side. We'll talk about a couple more of those. But first, let's talk about Bet Bet BetOnline has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football is heading to the big game now less than a week away. BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just football. BetOnline has up-to-the-minute info on pro and college hoops, NHL, boxing, a UFC, along with live real-time updates of current games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the new amazing vo- offers available for the 2022 season. Bet online where the game starts. All right, let, let's hop right back into it, Jeff, and uh, feel free to bring up the next game we can talk about. Yeah, you know, going along with that theme that you mentioned of uh, Kershaw hitting and pitching, and there was a game, it, it was it was kind of a meaningless game other than the fact that I was there. And so that was important to me. Uh, it was September 24th, 2016 against the Rockies. And the Dodgers just dominated. They won 14 to one. It was a, a huge game offensively for the Dodgers. Josh Reddick even hit a home run for the Dodgers. And uh, I think he had a double two. Uh, so I mean, any game that Josh Reddick actually hit the ball with the Dodgers, that was notable. He went three for four with five RBIs. I would suspect, I haven't looked, but I bet that was Josh Reddick's best game as a Dodger. Um, and it was, uh, but it was a dominant pitching performance by Kershaw. He went seven innings, uh, only allowed three hits, but he also went one for one with two sacrifice bunts at the plate. And so he he was uh, batted a thousand that game. And the one time he didn't sack bunt, he had laid down two great sacrifice bunts earlier in the game. And then he came up in the sixth inning, I think. And, uh, you know, bottom of the fifth. And he came up with, with two outs and uh, Reddick had doubled with one out and then uh, Howie Kendrick got out and then the, the Rockies intentionally walked Jock Peterson to get to Kershaw. And so there's two outs. Kershaw can't sack bunts. So Kershaw said, okay, I'll just go ahead and hit an RBI single instead. And so that made it seven to nothing Dodgers. Uh, he just hit a little line drive to, to left center field. And uh, like I said, I was at the game and I tweeted from my phone after that hit. I said, Clayton Kershaw is the best ever at everything. And a couple minutes later, I got a, a text from my sister who had taken a picture of the TV because we live here in Utah. And so uh, they were watching the game on the Rockies channel and uh, the Rockies channel popped my tweet up on the screen of their broadcast, me saying Clayton Kershaw is the best ever at everything. And uh, so I figure it, even they had to agree that night that Kershaw was awesome. And uh, it, it was one of those things that it kind of, underscores how special Kershaw is that it's just a meaningless September game. Uh, it was, the Dodgers were already, uh, you know, in first place and in a good situation, uh, game didn't matter that much, but it was still a very memorable game for me just because, uh, because Kershaw is such a special player. Yeah, that's a good one. And like I said, just sticking with that theme, um, I'm going to go to 2018. I'm going to lump these two together just for sake of time. Uh, but they both came in the 2018 playoffs, one against the Braves and the NLDS, one against the Brewers and the NLCS. Against the Braves, he only struck out three, but ended up having his longest 
a playoff outing at the, to that point, uh, throwing eight scoreless innings. Um, the first time we had ever got through seven innings uh, or past seven innings in the playoffs. Like I said, only three strikeouts. His pitch count was low enough for him to probably would have finished that game. I'm sure we had a debate about it or somebody debated about it uh, at the time. I think his pitch count was 85, but the Dodgers didn't really need him to go out and throw that last inning, and he wanted to preserve that that Kershaw solid performance. And then you go to 2018 in game five of the NLCS with the Dodgers down 2-1, and Kershaw ends up going seven innings that game. Uh, one run allowed, nine strikeouts, and I believe either drove in a run or scored a run. I, I, they're so confusing. I think he ended up scoring a run. He drew a walk, ended up scoring in the seventh inning, and then got pulled after that. But just lumping those two together, you know, Kershaw gets a lot of heat for postseason performances. But, you know, and, and even in that World Series in 2018, he didn't have the best performances. But he got the Dodgers there and helped the Dodgers get there with those two pitching performances. Yeah, absolutely. That game against the Braves is super memorable to me because he only struck out three guys, but he was just, it was as dominant as you can be without striking out very many guys. He uh, induced 13 ground balls and, you know, most of the time ground balls are just as good as a strikeout. Sometimes even better. He did get one uh, double play grounder. He actually gave up a double to Acuna, the first batter of the game. And Acuna went to, to second on a ground or went to third on a ground out. And then if I remember, I'm just scrolling through. I don't know if the if the Braves got another runner in scoring position after that. Uh, looking through, no, they didn't. They didn't get another runner in scoring position until the ninth inning against against Jansen, and that was just because Acuna singled. And then uh, Jansen, you know how how good how much he cares about base runners, uh, especially in a three nothing game. So Acuna stole second and stole third. Or defensive indifferenced himself to second and third. Uh, and that was it. Acuna in the first inning, Acuna in the ninth inning was the only runners in scoring position the, the Braves even got that game. And it was just, uh, like I said, as dominant as you can be without very many strikeouts. Next one. Um, I think, do, do I have another one? I mean, I have one more that we Let, can Let's talk do about. yours because I probably have uh, some, but let's talk about yours. It's probably on my list. Yeah. I mean, it's 2017 World Series game one. Um, you know, obviously, the first time Dodgers are in the World Series, Kershaw's on the mound against the against the Astros. It's close to 100 degrees at Dodger Stadium. Kershaw just goes out there and dominates seven innings, 11 strikeouts, just one run allowed. Came out with the small pitch count again. I think it was around 80 something. Uh, but just the fact that it was 9,500 degrees at Dodger Stadium, uh, the Dodgers weren't comfortably in the lead. But with Brandon Morrow and Kenley Jansen, that was essentially you know all you needed to do at that time was get, get, go seven innings and the Dodgers were, were more than likely going to win the game. And, you know, obviously we know what happened in game five of that, of that series. And, you know, being, I would have liked to have seen Kershaw throw without all that behind them in game five or back again at Dodger stadium, because when he did come back to Dodger stadium game seven, he ended up throwing what four scoreless shutout innings in, in relief. So at against Kershaw at Dodger stadium in the 2017 world series, the Astros scored one run in 11 innings against him. And that just shows you how much of a fluke type that series was when they went back to uh, Houston. Yeah, there's all sorts of hindsight stuff there. You know, another hindsight is maybe you do let Kershaw go another inning if you had known how overworked Morrow was going to be in that series uh, and, and the overwork had kind of already started. And so, you know, uh, maybe you let Kershaw go another inning there. But but yeah, it, it's uh, it's such a what might have been case when you look at how dominant he was at Dodger Stadium in that series. Uh, if it wasn't for the cheating cheaters from Southeast Texas, uh, you know Kershaw was probably the the World Series MVP in 2017, uh, maybe a co MVP with Jock Peterson, and you know that who knows what uh, butterfly effect effect that might have had. You know if Kershaw. If the Dodgers win the World Series in 2017 and Kershaw wins the World Series MVP, maybe Dave Roberts doesn't feel the need to use Clayton Kershaw in relief in 2019 NLDS, and Dodgers go on to win, win that World Series too. And, you know, we're looking at three World Series wins in four years and a World Series MVP, MVP for Kershaw, and it totally changes the narrative of his postseason career. And I know that's a lot of what-ifs, but uh, you know what? It just underscores why some of us uh, – aren't quite ready to forgive the cheating cheaters from Southeast Texas quite yet. Yeah. And, and that's just the way it is. And 
you know, we, we've come to the end of our list that we technically have. There was still a lot more we could talk about. There's you know, countless games where he had thrown complete games or seven plus innings, over 10 strikeouts, no walks. There was a stretch in uh, 2016 where he, he went like five games, had like 60 some strikeouts and a point. Six ERA or something like that. There, obviously, there's a lot of Kershaw. Even game one of the 2020 World Series that we were both at, he, you know, he wasn't quite a dominant Kershaw, eight innings or anything like that. But he went six innings, gave the one run, gave the Dodgers what they needed, and you know, it's just, I don't know if while well, we're talking about this, I don't think it's one of those things where we're talking like kind of reminiscing. But I do think that it just shows the importance of what Kershaw's been and why you know nobody wants him to go anywhere else except stay here with the Dodgers. And just knowing the fact that the Dodgers know, and we, Kershaw probably knows at this point that he would be like a number two or three guy on this team. Yeah, absolutely. There's also the the division clincher in 2017 against the Giants at Dodger Stadium. Just, you know, like you said, it was a case of you kind of always wanted to be at every Kershaw start because you never know when something special might happen. And uh, that the fact is he had – dozens and dozens of starts for the Dodgers during his peak that we could spend a segment talking about because he was, he was that good. Yeah, exactly. Um, we'll probably talk about our favorite pitching performances, non Kershaw at some point this week. We'll have Keith law on that's hopefully some point this week and we'll have all that coming for you right away on locked on Dodgers. So make locked on Dodgers your first listen of the day, every day, and make Locked On Bets your second listen of the day. Locked On Bets is your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. Just like us, free and available wherever you get podcasts. Jeff, is there anything you want to add before we officially head out? No, I'm good. I love Clayton Kershaw, and I'm not afraid. <laughs> Who knows it? There we go. <laughs> How do people do that? Man, my fingers don't make good hearts. Yeah, you got to have a longer finger, I think. Uh, but either way, that's Locked On Dodgers. We are here every weekday morning. Um, if you want to find us, you can search Locked On Dodgers wherever you get podcasts or on YouTube. If you want to find us on social media, we are on Twitter and Instagram at Locked On Dodgers. Jeff is on Twitter at Snide Dog. I'm at Vince Samperio. DMs are open on all those accounts for anything you need to get a hold of us for. You can also get a hold of us via email, LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com. Or send us a text or leave us a voicemail at 323-863-LOCK. That's 5625. We're here every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be with us when you get in your car or if you're at home. Tell your smart device to play a podcast, Locked on Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. Have a good one. We'll talk to you tomorrow.